The next speaker is John Langell. Dr. Langell completed his surgical training at Stanford University Medical Center and his advanced training in space and aerospace medicine with NASA at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. He is a surgeon and the executive director of the University of Utah Center for Medical Innovation. His talk, Innovation, Medicine, and Miracles, discusses the secret to innovation in medicine. Please welcome Dr. John Langell. Innovation. Innovation is something many of us aspire to, but most of us will never manage to achieve. But what is innovation? Fifty years ago, the world viewed innovation through the lens of NASA. As President Kennedy challenged us to get a man safely to the moon and back, it was an amazing time where we leveraged recent capabilities in submarine, aviation, and ballistic missile technologies to do something truly miraculous. Twelve years ago, when I was at NASA, we shifted from high-risk, short-term endeavors to trying to find a safe and sustainable presence in space. Our innovations we're now focused on keeping astronauts safe, developing novel ways to monitor, diagnose, and treat patients from as far away as 249 million miles on an expeditionary mission to Mars. These are both clear and important innovations that have been accomplished in our history. Though related, took substantially different knowledge bases and skill sets to achieve. So NASA is recognized as an innovative organization. But what is innovation? How do we define it? It's become the buzzword of our decade and is frequently overused. In fact, we no longer just innovate in general. We qualify our innovations. In my field, it's surgical innovation, or medical innovation, or sometimes global health innovation. But what is innovation, really? If I ask you to define it for me, most of you will have a difficult time articulating a clear definition of innovation. But you know it when you see it. Though commonplace now, laparoscopic surgery was a disruptive innovation. It allowed us to do large surgeries through small keyhole incisions, and patients had substantially less pain and often go home the very same day of their operation. It has transformed the way we deliver surgical care. And if you think about laparoscopy, it really does def really fit the definition of what we think innovation is. And it's opened, opened up in a whole new field. There's been new innovations around laparoscopy, CO2 insufflators, extended articulating instruments, robotic surgery. And when we think about innovation, we think about it happening rapidly, disrupting the current models and processes by which we practice. But does it really happen rapidly? Think about laparoscopy again. Surgeons will tell you it's transformed our landscape over just the last three decades. But most of them would be surprised to find out that the first laparoscopic surgical case was performed on a patient over 100 years ago. So maybe it doesn't have to be rapid, but it should be. If we can figure out how to accelerate innovation, we can make a bigger difference for people now and improve health care now while it's really important. So we have a sense of what innovation is. How do I ident identify who the great innovators are going to be? Well, Clayton Christensen has described for us the characteristics of innovators. And others have described the characteristics of innovative organizations. But 
a retrospective view. And not every great innovator has those characteristics. So when we think of great innovators, we tend to conjure images of people like Steve Jobs. He transformed our lives and the way that we acquire and process data. But what was it that let him do what he did? What was his secret? Some people will tell you that the ability to innovate is innate. You have to be born with it. While others, like those of us at the University of Utah, believe that we can develop innovators through creative, experiential education and resourcing. So what is the secret to innovation? Well, I'm going to share that secret with you. But first, I want to share with you a miraculous story of innovation that took place right here at the University of Utah. And not two decades ago, but in the very recent past, and by a team of individuals that some of you in the know, room will know well. 18 months ago, Dean Wallace, a graduate of the University of Utah School of Medicine, a pathologist by training, and a well-recognized innovator and entrepreneur in the biotech and medtech sector, came to me with a problem. He said, John, cervical cancer is the number four cancer killer in women, and it is a preventable disease. One quarter million women per year die from cervical cancer, and nine out of 10 of those are in developing regions of the world. Furthermore, acetic acid, the active ingredient in everyday vinegar, has been proven to be a really cheap and effective method to diagnose precancerous lesions. And the World Health Organization has given us screen and treat guidelines that leverage acetic acid to be able to screen women, find the lesions before they come cancer, and treat them. But somewhere we have failed. And the failure point is that the technologies we have to actually treat these lesions are too expensive. They require a talented biomedical workforce to maintain them. They require electricity or cryogenic gases, both of which may not be available in the developed setting. So Dean reiterated to me, he said, we need to come together and solve this problem, and I will fund it, and I will make sure that we get it out to the market. Well, this problem really hit home for me. I've been fortunate enough to do a great deal of work in global health, and on one of my recent trips to Gujarat, India, at a remote hospital site, I was asked by a local gynecologist to come see a patient in distress. There was worry that she had peritonitis, so they sought the help of a general surgeon. On examination, she had a pelvic mass. And on further evaluation, we found a fungating lesion on her cervical os, almost certainly late stage cervical cancer. The gynecologist explained to me that this is a very common problem for them, that though this is a treatable disease, the resources and the dollars necessary to be able to identify these early were really unavailable. So it was very frequent that they found them late stage. So I decided that this was a project that we wanted to take on at the Center for Medical Innovation. And to do that, I put together a team, a team to work with Dean and to work with the resourcing at the Center for Medical Innovation to help solve this critical problem. It's an interdisciplinary team of graduate students from a diverse background who came together to solve something that was going to have true and massive impact if they could do it well. I want you to meet Tim, a biomedical engineering graduate student, Chris, an MBA student, Brian, a design student, and Ashley and Ashley, two medical students from the second year class of the University of Utah School of Medicine. And this is no ordinary team. This team of students had already come to us to get unique innovation program education 
at the Center for Medical Innovation. And we resourced them. We pro provided them access to a prototyping lab, to a usability testing center, to information and informatics, to patients, to the clinical setting, and to key opinion leaders, our physicians and our clinicians. Our industry partner, Dean, brought in critical market knowledge, an understanding of the competitive landscape. He knew what was out there. He knew the shortfalls of the current technologies. He had access to capital. And most importantly, he knew how to take a product from early development all the way through to commercialization. So this team took on the task. They validated the problem. They conducted stakeholder analysis, market analysis, ethnographic research observations. They began design-based prototype development, verification, validation, and usability studies. And in three months, they had a fully functional prototype that had been bench tested and exceeded the World Health Organization requirements to treat cervical intraepithelial neoplasia 1, 2, and 3, the most common form found of precancerous cervical lesions. In three months, they achieved something that multi-billion dollar biotech companies struggle to do in one year. And their device cost $50 to make, was battery powered, could get up to 50 treatments in a single charge, was automated, lighted, and could, if you chose, auto-sterilize. By four months, they had created a partnership with the World Health Organization's lead on cervical cancer, who loved the technology and applied for a grant to study it clinically in Africa. The NIH provided $2.5 million. By six months, Dean and his team of students had a full company built and had already filed their FDA regulatory clearance paperwork. By nine months, the device was used in clinical trials in India, South America, and Africa. At 10 months, the Gates Foundation recognized the value of the technology and provided additional funds to ensure that this important technology was going to be available to the masses. By a year, over 20 devices were deployed across the globe to rave reviews, and we began to get more phone calls demanding its availability. June 2016. Dean and this tremendous interdisciplinary team of students working on this critical global health problem received formal US Food and Drug Administration clearance to sell their product in market. In 16 months, they achieved something that typically takes five to seven years if you're lucky enough to get this far. And they did it using Center for Medical Innovation resources and a group of students who had been educated in our program. A truly miraculous feat for a team of students who had never done this before. So what is the secret to innovation that I promised you? It's the power of an interdisciplinary team and their diversity of knowledge. Not a team that has functioned, experiences, and learned within the world of how things are done, but one impassioned by a critical problem and allowed to free, think freely about how things can be done. A team empowered to innovate, to create, and to translate. And how do we accelerate that process? We accelerate it by reaching outside of our own organizations. This team had industry and academia come together in a partnership to do something absolutely spectacular. They leveraged the capabilities and knowledge of a powerful team of interdisciplinary graduate students 
and the resources at the University of Utah, and Dean Wallace's amazing experiences in the biotech world. So innovation can be taught. I've shown you that. But it's best taught to those who have not been found and constrained by the world of how we do things, but how things can be done. And it is almost never a single individual who creates the innovations. It's a team of individuals, an interdisciplinary team with a broad skill set and knowledge base who come together to do something very powerful. Steve Jobs was a visionary, but the technologies that we use every day in our lives were not created by Steve Jobs. That was a group of individuals who came together with a diverse knowledge base, working together to turn his vision into the innovations that we use every day. Thank you very much.